Now, as the, regards these moments themselves, they are directly derived from the notion of end in itself, of a being whose end is its own self. For sensibility expresses in general the simple notion of organic reflection into self, or the universal fluidity of this, this notion. Irritability, though, expresses organic elasticity, the capacity of the organism to react at the same time that it is reflected into itself. The actualization which is opposed to the initial quiescent being within self, an actualization in which that abstract being for self is a being for another. Reproduction, however, is the action of this whole intro-reflected organism, its activity as in itself an end or as genus, in which the individual repels itself from itself, and in the procreative act reproduces either its organic members or the whole individual. Reproduction taken in the sense of self-preservation in general expresses the formal notion of the organism, or sensibility. But it is, strictly speaking, the real organic notion, or the whole, which returns into itself, either qua individual by producing single parts of itself, or qua genus by bringing forth individuals. Hegel has now introduced for us these three moments, as he's going to call them, or we might say functions, of the organic being, the organism, uh, sensibility, irritability, and reproduction. And these are, you might say, central categories for analysis of the, the science of his own time that he is examining but not entirely endorsing. Now, here in paragraph 266, what we see Hegel doing is um, framing these three in terms of what should now be fairly familiar motifs of Hegelian dialectics. So we're going to see him talking about, you know, the notion, universal fluidity, um, you know, repulsion of, of self from self in, in this reproduction, um, you know, being for self, being being for another, all these, these metaphysical categories. That doesn't mean that Hegel is actually endorsing this, we might say, grand schema as what is the basis for an adequate natural science in terms of natural science turned towards organisms, observing reason, engaging in you know, biology. What he is doing is trying to call out what he thinks is actually valuable in this approach. But we're going to see in the paragraphs to come, he's also going to say mm, some of this doesn't actually hold up. So, what is he doing here in, in this paragraph? He says, as regard these moments, these three moments themselves, they are directly derived from the notion of what? the notion of organism that we've been exploring so far. And we've seen that if we don't get the notion right, but rely on what Hegel's calling picture thinking, we're not going to be able to fully grasp uh, what's going on with, with organism. And he thinks that at, at times observing reason has actually done, done that. So what's the notion? The notion is of an end in itself. Not the Kantian end in itself that you might be thinking of when you hear about that from you know, the second critique or the, the uh, groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. Here we're talking about organism per se as being a, a, the kind of being that is an end in itself. Um, we saw that already discussed in some of the earlier paragraphs. Or, as, as we, we could say, a being whose end, whose telos, whose goal is continuing and perhaps even augmenting or causing to flourish uh, its own self, its own being, to continue in existence as an organic being. Not just as a static thing, but as something that has life and it has these three functions. So, he says, um, these are the moments. Let's take a look at each of these moments now. So he says, sensibility expresses a simple notion of organic reflection into self. And then he gives us a gloss on this saying, well, that's the universal fluidity of the notion. Now, when we think about sensibility, think about your, your capacity to sense things, seeing, hearing, 
smelling, tasting, um, you know, the various senses that we all associate into one big uh, miscellaneous category called touch, which include everything from, you know, touching things to feeling pressure to feeling pain, you know, who, a bunch of different things, right? Now, sensibility, as he's saying, is an organic reflection into self. What does that mean? It means that sensibility is the organism able to take in what's outside of it and make it an object for itself. It is aware of externalities. Some of them maybe, you know, when they're right up against it, like when you taste something, right? But some of it in other ways that are acting at a distance. Um, you know, for us humans, we tend to think of sight and hearing that way. But for um, other animals, it, it can be vibration or, you know, sensing heat or even odor. Think about the, the uh, uh, function that odor uh, plays for so many other things, un unlike us who have uh, lost most of our, our sense of smell. So what is going on there? We, this is a function of organic beings. Why is he talking about the universal fluidity? Because if sensibility or sensitivity is not fluid enough, it can't take in that whole range of stuff out there that we can then experience. You know, Aristotle says in a certain way, the soul becomes all things, um, and we don't want to get in too deep into the de anima and, you know, abstraction and stuff like that. But um, Aristotle also thought that the, you know, the, the, the soul, the psyche, the, the animate principle within the body was able to take in information from the outside through the senses. And so that is, is part of what's going on there. The, the sensibility has to be able to adapt itself to bring in to itself other things. We might have different metaphysics, uh, you know, explaining precisely how this, this happens. Um, there's many of them available. You know, we have some interesting ones proposed to us by modern science today that are no doubt better than what Hegel had in his own time. But the key issue remains the same. Um, how is the organic being able to not just engage in stimulus response, but to grasp things outside of itself as things, to perceive them? So there's a lot involved there, you can see. What about irritability? He says, uh, irritability expresses organic elasticity. Well, that's different than just this organic fluidity. Elasticity, a capacity to, to give and come back and respond. Um, a capacity to react. A capacity to react, he says, that um, is at the same time reflected into itself. The actualization that is opposed to the initial quiescent being within self, an actualization in which that abstract being for self is for another. This is another key aspect of organic beings. It's not just that they perceive their environment and grasp things within their environment as distinct things. They also, at least animate, you know, animal life, are going to react to them. Even plants are reacting in certain ways, although you know, very slowly, largely through through the function of reproduction, through growth, cell growth. But animals that have a nervous system of sorts, and there are many different kinds, just fascinating stuff when you start looking into how spiders work and, and how they differ from insects, you know, how arachnids in general differ from them, uh, and then, you know, how vertebrates, how things go on with them, just fascinating stuff. Um, Hegel's going to talk about this in terms of the muscular system as, as well. But that is a key function of living beings. And then finally, we get to reproduction. Here he talks about reproduction the, is being the action of the whole or entire intro-reflected organism. Um, and he says uh, its activity as in itself an end or as, as genus. 
uh, involves self-repulsion. The individual, he says, repels itself from itself. This is, you know, we've seen this, this movement carried out in Hegelian dialectics. The same is self-repulsive to itself, generates its other out of itself. And what do we have there? Well, we have re reproduction in which we, you know, little hamsters make more new little hamsters that are different little hamsters, but of the same, of the same genus. And you could say the end there is a continuing, not merely of the individual being, because it is not actually the individual being as such that is continued. It is a continuance of a similar kind of being, a genus, right? In individuals. So he says, um, here we go. In the procreative act re reproduces either its organic members or the whole individual. Um, then he says, reproduction taken in the sense of self-preservation. So what, what are we talking about with self-preservation? Continuing in our own being. That, he says, expresses the formal notion of the organism or sensibility. But it, it is, strictly speaking, the real organic notion of the whole, which returns into itself, either as an individual by producing single parts of itself, re, you know, reproduction of self as self, or qua genus bringing forth other individuals, new individuals, which then take the place of the individual that's left behind, perhaps on the spot, as with certain animals that die off when their, their young are created. Some of them die off actually after they've mated. Um, or, you know, maybe later in time, like us, after we're able to pass on something more, an education, a building, a culture, to our progeny. But this is what Hegel makes of these three key moments here in terms of his own metaphysics. The other significance of these organic elements, that is, as outer, is their particular shape, according to which they are present as outwardly actual, but at the same time, universal parts or organic systems. Sensibility, let us say, is a nervous system, irritability as a muscular system, reproduction as a visceral system, for the preservation of the individual and the species. In the previous paragraph, Hegel was talking about the inner of these different moments of you know, sensibility, irritability, reproduction. Now in 267, he is going to talk about the outer, and then he's going to bring these back together in later paragraphs. And he says that there is an other significance of these organic elements, that is the outer, and he says um, it it lies in their particular shape, is how Miller is translating it. Uh, gestaltete visa, their, you might say their shape works for that. Um, and it does convey that, you know, gestalt, um, but you might say shaped um, kind, shaped way, shape, shaped modality, right? And what does this consist in? He says that... Um, they're present as outwardly actual, as virically, as something we can observe. That's what we're interested in here. But at the same time, universal parts, that's kind of an interesting thing to say, universal parts or organic systems, right? Organic systems are part of a larger whole, which is the organism itself. And so he's suggesting one way in which we can interpret this um, he is not endorsing this again. He's just saying this is one way in which you can do that. You can think of sensibility as being the function of the, the shape, the organic uh, unity of the nervous system. Um, so that would be the perceptual apparatus and you know, the nerves and, and perhaps you know, other stuff as well. Irritability, he says, well, think of that in terms of the muscular system. Perhaps, you know, we also want to include the skeletal system in that as well. Um, it's what you need in order to actually do anything uh, with, with the, the body, right? Um, and then reproduction, uh, what, what Miller's translating as the visceral system, the Eingeweide, which we could just say is the, the entrails, the guts, you know, the uh, the organs in general. Some of those organs 
would be uh, presumably the genital organs, but you, you would also include, say, for example, the gastrointestinal tract, right? Because you have to be able, in order to survive, in order to reproduce your being, you have to be able to devour things, to eat things, to, and then digest them, derive the nutrients from them, and eliminate the wastes. So um, he says this is a, a visceral system not only for the preservation of the species, but also for the individual. Um, so that would be one way in which we could, we could say that um, this is externalized, right? Not just for human beings, but for bugs, and for mollusks, and for whatever else that we want to look at. The laws peculiar to organisms accordingly concern a relationship of the organic moments in their twofold significance. One is being part of the organic structure, and again is being a universal fluid determinateness which pervades all those systems. Thus, in formulating such a law, a specific sensibility, for example, would find its expression qua moment of the whole organism in a specifically formed nervous system, or it would also be linked up with a specific reproduction of the organic parts of the individual, or with the propagation of the whole, and so on. Both aspects of such a law can be observed. The outer, in accordance with its notion, is being for another. Sensibility, for example, has its immediately actualized mode in the system of sensibility, and as a universal property, it is in its outer expressions and objective existence as well. The aspect which is called the inner has its own outer aspect, which is distinct from what, is, what in general is called the outer. Here in paragraph 268, Hegel is now bringing together these two aspects of inner and outer that are, uh, you might say, correlative and essential to any organic being, which is what reason is attempting to, to make sense of, attempting to observe, right? And he's going to talk now about laws proper or peculiar or specific to organisms. Uh, observing reason wants to make sense out of, out of organic beings. Um, we've already done a lot of the groundwork for that. Now an important uh, shift is going to take place. So he says that these laws proper to organisms have to do with a relation. They're trying to articulate a relation. Uh, and he talks here about a doubled significance or uh, the, the Miller text actually has a uh, twofold significance, but gedoppelt is the German, so doubled. Uh, think of this, this splitting. We have, on the one hand, um, the part uh, of an organic structure that is being discussed. On the other hand, we have this universal fluid determinateness. So if we think about it in, in more specific terms, right, we have um, you know, a part of the organic structure namely the muscular system that we just talked about in the last paragraph, corresponding to the universal fluid determinateness of irritability. These are both sides of the organic being. With just a set of organs, you don't have a fully organic being, Hegel would say. There has to be this universal fluid determinateness, this capacity to, to be more, to transcend, to respond to the organs themselves. Um, on the other hand, you don't have some, you know, uh, ghostly soul floating around just with faculties that is not already connected with an organic system. So we have the outer and we have the inner. The law is supposed to tell us something about the relation between them. And now remember, Hegel already proposed to us and then started, you know, picking at uh, one relation that these have, the, namely that the outer is the expression of the inner, or the inner expresses itself through the outer, might be another way of saying it. Is he actually going to bring that up here? No. And you should probably ask yourself why he's not reaffirming that at this point, but rather developing this further. So he says, in formulating such a law, for example, a specific sensibility would find its expression, qua moment of the whole organism, on this side, in a specifically formed nervous system. Or it would also be linked up, if we're talking about reproduction, with a specific reproduction of the organic parts of the individual, or the propagation of the whole, and so on. 
Now, um, Hegel's going to tell us a little bit more about this. He says both aspects of the law can be observed. It makes perfect sense to say we can observe the outer aspects, because they're outer, right? Or they're observable. That's part of, it kind of goes, goes without saying in a certain respect. Um, you want to, you know, know how a, uh, a certain organism works? Well, you can, you know, observe it by looking at it. You might dissect it. You might do x-rays. There might be all sorts of things that you do, right? Um, he says, the outer in accordance with its notion is being for another. So sensibility, for example, has its immediately actualized mode in the system of sensibility. What, what does all that verbiage mean? The being for another is the being for the observer. The external aspects of the organic being, the organism, are observable by and on. Um, so, you know, the, the system of sensibility, you know, you can dissect the the frog and look at its eyeballs and how its nerves work and all, all that other sort of interesting stuff or perhaps gross you out stuff depending on how you feel about dissection. What about this side? He doesn't, he doesn't then say, and now on the other hand, correlative that. Instead, he says, um, the aspect which is called the inner has its own outer aspect which is distinct from what in general is called the outer. We saw this discussed just earlier, several paragraphs ago, where Hegel said in order for the inner to be observed, it must have a kind of externality, something by which we can grasp it. If it were just pure universal fluid determinateness, it would lie beyond the grasp of our reason or understanding. So. Here he's setting something up that now in the next paragraph um, we're going to look at more closely. Both aspects of an organic law would thus no doubt be observable, but not the law connecting them. And observation is unable to perceive these laws, not because qua observation it is too short-sighted and ought not to proceed empirically, but ought to start from the idea, for such laws, if they were something real, must in fact actually exist and therefore be observable. But rather because the conception of laws of this kind proves to have no truth. You'll notice that I've done something here that I almost never do, which is leave the same stuff on the chalkboard. I think I've only done that once before throughout this entire series, going back through the previous 200 odd paragraphs. Why did I do that? Well, because he is uh, continuing the exact same line in this, this discussion in paragraph 269. He says, both aspects of an organic law would thus no doubt be observable. So here's one aspect here, the outer, and here is another aspect here, the inner observed through its outer. But then he says, you can't actually observe the law connecting them. Now, does that mean that you can't cognize it at all or infer it or anything like that? No, you are doing that, otherwise you wouldn't have a law to work with but you can't directly observe the law itself. So he says, observation is unable to perceive these laws. Now, why is that? He considers an interesting possibility. One possibility would be qua observation, it's too short-sighted and ought not to proceed empirically, but ought to start from the idea, to start from some sort of ideal uh, you know, set of principles or something like that. Um, Hegel doesn't endorse that. For, you know, as much as people like to say, ah, Hegel, you know, he deduces everything out of uh, his, his ideas. No, that's, that's the opposite. And he's actually uh, saying that you can't do that here in, in observing reason. He says, um, such laws, if they were something real, must in fact actually exist and therefore be observable. I, laws that would proceed from the idea. Instead, he suggests, and here we, he's not going to tell us why, that's going to come in the paragraphs that follow, 
But he's going to say, the conception of laws of this kind proves to have no truth. So what we've done in exploring this is set up a, a possibility only to knock it down. And you might say, you know, why bother then doing it? Well, we're learning something in the process. In the, in the paragraphs to come, Hegel is going to show us why laws like this are not really going to work for us the way that we hope that they do and when we're watching, observing reason, carrying out its many projects and uh, uh, trying to, you know, formulate laws for organic beings.